He's a professor of computer science at MIT, a member of the Broad Institute, and a member of the computer science and AI lab at MIT, where he directs the computational biology group. His research spans many areas, including disease genetics, epigenomics, gene circuitry, non-coding RNAs, comparative genomics, and phylogenetics. He's helped direct several large-scale genomics projects, including the Roadmap Epigenomics Project at the NIH, the ENCODE Project, and the Genotype Tissue Expression Project. Among his many honors, he has received the US Presidential Early Career Award for Science, the NSF Career Award, and the Alfred P. Sloan Fellowship. And beyond his work in science, uh, Manolis is just a truly contagious individual with a zest for life. Um, and has inspired many students, including myself, which is why I'm so excited for you to come today. So uh, without further ado, we can, we can start whenever you're ready. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're on mute. for having me. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you so much for also putting together these events. I think uh, it means a lot to the students. It means a lot to the community. And uh, especially at a time when all of us are stuck at home, it's really so nice to be able to sort of connect to so many across the world. So. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is our quest for translating genetic findings into therapeutic insights. And specifically, how do we dissect and manipulate disease circuitry at single cell resolution? The work is in collaboration with many, many labs that I'm going to try to um, acknowledge and uh, note along the way, because this really exemplifies the extremely interdisciplinary nature of our field. Our work really starts with genetics. And the field of genetics has truly exploded. The human genome was published 20 years ago to the date. And it's quite remarkable how much has happened since then. And one of the most dramatic shifts that happened with the Human Genome Project is the fact that we actually can sequence the entire, non ju not just coding, but also non-coding landscape of the genome. And that in turn enabled this beautiful explosion of genome-wide association studies. The ability to catalog all human genetic variations systematically to discover haplotype blocks of co-inherited groups of variants, enabling us to now tag individual variants within these blocks and then go all out with dramatic reductions in cost because of the ability to genotype instead of whole genome sequence hundreds of thousands of individuals that both carry disease phenotypes and also provide unaffected controls for every one of these disorders, enabling genome-wide association studies to reveal hundreds of more than 100,000 genome-wide significant hits across the genome. What do those look like? Here's an example. This is body mass index, a measure of obesity. And you can see here 6 million common variants on the x-axis with their genomic position. And then on the y-axis, the minus log 10 p-value of a simple chi-square statistical test that basically tells us, are the two alleles of this variant differentially present in cases versus controls for high BMI, for obesity? And what you see here is reigning supreme above all these loci is the FTO region. This is the strongest genetic association with obesity, which was discovered in 2007. And of course, dozens of others have since been discovered. That allows us to now have the promise of completely unbiased views for disease mechanism, for being able to understand what are truly the causes of human disease and the unbiased discovery of new target genes genes that were completely unsuspected to underlie obesity. In this particular case, the FTO gene and that region was completely off the radar. Nobody was expecting it to have any roles in obesity. And hopefully the ability to develop new therapeutics and enable precision medicine and even personalized medicine. So let's now look as to what happens when we dive into detail in any one of those loci. Here's the FTO locus. You can see all those dots. These are different genetic variants. When you expand it out, they look you know, kind of flat. And you can see that there are 89 common variants, all associated with obesity in the same locus. But the most surprising finding 
is that if you look at these variants closely and if you look at where are the protein coding parts of the FTO gene, you see that there's a tiny little protein coding part here, exon 2, a slightly larger pro protein coding part, exon 3, and so on and so forth. But most of the variants, in fact, nearly, sorry, all of the variants lie in non-coding regions. And that's not true just for these FTO locus. This is true for 93% of disease loci. What we see is that they, in fact, do not perturb the genes directly. And that's so important on the 20th anniversary of the human genome because there was, in fact, great debate as to whether we should even sequence the known coding parts of the human genome. Many people argued that because repeats cover about 50% of the human genome and genes only cover 1.5% of the human genome, it would be basically a waste of valuable resources to go after the non-coding portion. And yet, how wrong were we in thinking that it was all going to be about protein coding genes? 93% of those hits from genome-wide association studies, from common variants associated with disease, are in fact falling in non-coding regions. And in retrospect, it kind of makes sense because common variants are not quite allowed to have strong effects because something in, that has a very strong detrimental effect on disease will be maintained at low frequency in the population. Instead, the weak effect variants that are associated with disease are tolerated at higher frequencies, which is in a way almost a requirement for genome-wide association studies to be able to discover it. So that basically means that common variants are predominantly non-coding, but rare variants are much more likely to be coding. Of course, the challenge with rare variants is that number one, they're very difficult to discover. And number two, they do not account for as much heritability, if you wish, in the population. For any one individual, yes, certainly they're stronger, but across the population, they're not uh, as, as prevalent. So the challenge, of course, is upon us. How do we now discover the mechanism underlying FTO and 120,000 other loci that are associated with disease? Because for those loci, we don't actually know the target gene. In this particular case, everybody was pretty convinced that the gene is probably FTO that you know, has some kind of role in, DNA, in RNA methyl transferation. So, so basically, it's an RNA methyl transferase. It basically transfers methyl groups, specifically M6A, um, out of the epitranscriptome, out of the uh, mature transcripts. And M6A is associated with uh, degradation, with stability, and all kinds of other functions. So many people started saying, OK, great. Let's go after these functions to understand obesity. It turns out <laughs> the FTO gene has nothing to do with obesity, uh, as I'm going to show you shortly. Um, and this region is, in fact, targeting two other genes that are sitting 1.2 million nucleotides away and 600,000 nucleotides away. So that basically means that we really don't know what the target genes of these disease loci are going to be. It also means that we don't know the causal variant because among all of these 89 common variants, nearly all of them are identically associated. So it's very difficult to know which one is causal or is in protein coding regions, we could say, aha, the one that overlaps a protein is probably the causal one. It also means that we don't know the cell type of action because these variants might be active in, I don't know, adipocytes, these variants might be acting in liver, these, these variants might be acting in the brain and so on and so forth. So knowing the causal variant is extremely important in figuring out the cell type and the tissue where this variant is acting. And of course, not knowing any of that means that we don't know the relevant pathways, we don't know the mechanisms, we don't know the upstream regulators, we don't know the circuitry. And therefore, it's very difficult to translate this promise of genetics into mechanistic insights and delivering on this promise. And that's what our group is uh, systematically doing for the last 20 years now. We're basically trying to systematically dissect the mechanism of disease-associated loci. We start with genetic associations across a diversity of traits. Here I'm actually showing the APOE locus associated with Alzheimer's disease and many other Alzheimer's and neurodegeneration associated loci. These variants across both common and rare allele frequency spectra, enabling us to reveal regions that are associated with disease. Not quite the mechanism, but we know there's something in this region. 
what we need to do is systematically profile the intermediate molecular phenotypes that are changing with these genetic alterations. And that's why our group in many collaborations in multiple consortia, as well as in our own experimental lab, have been profiling the RNA expression level, the transcriptional output of these regions, as well as the epigenomic landscape in these regions in both healthy and disease samples. Why do we need both? First of all, to understand the difference between healthy and disease as a group, but also to understand how these genetic variants are acting at the RNA and at the epigenomic level for both healthy and disease individuals. Namely, are the individuals with a G or a T at that particular location showing higher or lower expression or different epigenomic marks in that region? Number three, we're integrating all these data sets to now start systematically understanding what are driver genes, regions, and cell types underlying every one of these genetic regions of association based on the specific mechanistic insights that these data sets are giving us. And number four, we're validating the predictions in human cells and in mouse models and disseminating the results in the larger community. Why do we profile the epigenome? Why don't we just profile RNA? Well, the reason is that the epigenome is the handle to the known coding genome. Namely, transcripts only tell us about the protein coding parts because that's, you know, the mature mRNA contains, you know, the untranslated regions at the five prime and three prime end, but also mostly the protein coding parts of the genome. They don't tell us about the non-coding landscape. And the non-coding landscape is full of control elements that govern the expression patterns of those genes. And those control elements are marked epigenomically in all of the cell types where they act by three types of modifications. Number one, at the DNA level, the CPG dinucleotide uh, base pair, double base pair, basically gives us a handle to repression in regulatory regions where the C is undergoing methylation and same for that C here. So methyl C is sometimes referred to as the fifth base and it is associated with repression in regulatory regions. Interestingly, it's associated with activation in protein coding regions and transcribed regions, but mostly for regulatory regions, you can think of DNA methylation as a repressive mark. DNA accessibility tells you where are those nucleosomes that DNA is wrapped around going to be positioned, and namely whether transcription factors, whether the regulators that recognize these short sequence motifs will be able to bind in these locations or not, or whether you need a pioneer factor who's able to actually bind these motifs and open up chromatin in these regions. And then the third type of modification is on the nucleosomes themselves, every one of which is made out of eight histone proteins, H2A, H2B, H3, H4 is the most common combination of these two copies each. And then these eight histone proteins together make up one nucleosome around which 147 nucleotides are wrapped. So these 200 base per blocks, if you wish, have different colors. And these colors are associated with different functions. So every cell type in our body has the same genome to a good approximation. But every cell in our body uses a different subset of that genome. And some cells use, say, liver-associated functions if they're a liver cell, or brain-associated functions if they're a brain cell, or neuronal versus microglial versus oligodendrocyte versus astrocyte functions, depending on what type of brain cell you are, all of these use a different subset of the 23 volumes of this encyclopedia of all of human DNA knowledge, if you wish. And the way that they remember which parts of these enormous volumes of 3 billion base pairs are important is that they underline, they highlight, and they you know, put post-it notes on that code. And these histone modifications are those post-it notes. They're basically post-translational modifications of the tails of histone proteins that stick out and that therefore tell the cell 
you know, every cell, here are the important regulatory regions and here are the repressed regions and here's the heterochromatic regions so that the cell can very easily and very rapidly look up the information that it needs. And they serve as a form of epigenetic memory of the linear specification of every one of those cells. So by systematically profiling this epigenome, we can now infer the circuitry of the genome by understanding where are the regulatory elements, but also by understanding how they vary across different tissues and cell types. So what that gives us is the ability to go back into those regions of association where we know that there's a disease locus that plays some role in disease. And instead of saying, well, there's something going on here, we can ask, what are the specific nucleotide variants, the RSIDs associated with the disease in that location? Where do these variants lie in terms of the known coding annotation using these epigenomic marks to define enhancer regions and promoter regions? So enhancers are these long range acting distant regulatory regions and promoters are these very proximal regions where the RNA polymers will eventually start transcribing to create those uh, RNA transcripts. Knowing these enhancer regions allows us to now start asking about what are the upstream regulators whose motifs are found there or that are experimentally found to be binding these locations. Knowing the epigenomics of many different cell types allows us to ask what cell types are these regions active in. And then being able to understand the correlation patterns between non-coding regions turning on and genes turning on in matching cell types across a large diversity of cell types allows us to now start linking these non-coding regions to their target genes and predicting what are the possible genes downstream of these regulatory control elements that contain these non-coding variants that are associated with disease. So we are now in a position to start dissecting the circuitry of these disease regions. So our group has been systematically inferring these circuits for many years now, and we've published a series of resources, the last one of which only appeared an hour ago. And we also have been collaborating with experimental scientists who are experts in each of these disorders to then apply this knowledge systematically to understand the circuitry of specific disease regions. One such example we published about five years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine in collaboration with Melina Klausenter, Hans Hauner, and many others uh, in the field. We focused on that very first slide that I showed you, the FTO locus, that association with obesity. And what we found is that out of the 89 common variants in that region, we could narrow down the association to just one variant that disrupts a T in an AT rich motif into a C that loses this AT rich motif and can no longer be bound by the upstream regulator creatively named AT rich interacting domain 5B because it has an AT rich interacting domain. So this is a repressor that normally binds that motif and represses this massive 12 KB super enhancer that we found in that first 10 KB of this region of association with obesity. What does this repression actually do? Well, it acts in mesenchymal stem cells. These are the progenitor cells that will then give rise to either white fat, which are the cells that store all of the excess calories in your diet. So if you eat a lot more than you exercise, you will have excess calories at the end of the day and your body will be able to store those for a rainy day. And this used to be super, super important when food was scarce. Right now, it's not as a great of an idea. So that's one option for your excess calories. What's the other option? The other option is to just burn them. And in fact, just like white adipocytes can in fact store calories, brown adipocytes and beige adipocytes can burn calories through a process known as thermogenesis, generation of heat. So by depolarizing their mitochondrial membrane, beige and brown adipocytes can basically cause a proton transfer, lower that um, gradient and lose energy instead of creating ATP, you're just wasting away 
these uh, calories in burning them. And of course, it's helpful in warming you up in the winter, but it's also helpful in not becoming chubby if all you do is sit at the office and give uh, Zoom presentations or listen to Zoom presentations. So what we found is that this mesenchymal stem cell progenitor super enhancer was in fact guiding that differentiation. How? Via long range interactions with two target genes, IRX3 and IRX5. Here's what's quite kind of fascinating. IRX3 sits 600,000 nucleotides away from this SNP. IRX5 sits 1.2 million nucleotides away. There's several genes over. So that basically tells us that we can't just look under the lamp post. We can't just say, oh, great. Here's the FTO gene. It sits in the FTO locus. That must be the target. We have to instead say, what is the circuitry? What cell type does something act in? Who are the upstream regulators? What are the downstream target genes? What is the causal motif? What are the genomic signals telling us about where that causal motif acts? And how can we systematically understand the downstream targets of these genes? Why do we want that? Why do we want this circuitry? It's not just an academic exercise. The reason why this circuitry is so important is because it's only through understanding the circuitry that we can actually intervene. Just simply knowing the FTO locus is associated with obesity, we would be able to do nothing about it. But knowing the upstream regulator, the downstream target gene, the causal variant, the cell type of action, the pathological signatures of obesity through thermogenesis, and the intermediate molecular and cellular phenotypes, we can actually intervene. We can start modulating these knobs and we know what to measure. We know where to measure it. We know how to intervene. And that's why manipulating the circuitry can actually reverse the disease phenotypes. So what we showed in our paper is that each of these knobs of intervention can in fact work like a switch to go back and forth between lean and obese phenotypes. In particular, the single nucleotide alteration out of 3.2 billion nucleotides in the human genome, changing one letter from C in the risk individuals to T, restoring that AT rich motif and restoring the binding of this regulator and restoring the repression of RX3 and RX5, that single nucleotide alteration was sufficient to completely restore the process of thermogenesis, measured as the relative oxygen consumption rate, uncoupled as a percent of basal, for both control and isoproteranol stimulated conditions. In the risk individuals, this thermogenesis process is simply non-functional. But as soon as you alter that single letter, you're able to completely restore it, a factor of seven increase, and therefore, primary cells from adipocytes of risk individuals were able to suddenly thermogenize again. And that's not all. We can also go and modulate the downstream target genes. And we can do that in both, um, you know, human, of course, in human cell lines, but also in mouse to look at the animal phenotypes, the organismal phenotypes. And what we found is that a dominant negative form of IREX3 one of the downstream target genes, repressed here in the same direction that the ARID5B regulator would push it, compared to physiological conditions, was in fact leading with adipocyte expression driven by this AP2 protein, uh, locus. We were able to actually show that these mice completely lose all of their fat stores. They're no longer able to store fat. They're just burning it off. Moreover, when you put these mice that start out leaner in a high fat diet, you see that the control mice eventually gain weight, but these mice are unable to gain weight. So what this told us is that we nailed the circuitry. We now know how to intervene, not just in what you eat and whether you exercise or not, but in the very knob of your metabolic circuitry to decide if your cells are gonna be burning those calories or storing those calories. These mice did not change their diet. These mice did not change their exercise. All they did was turn on that thermogenesis process to burn calories when they were awake and also when they were sleeping. 
And that's what manipulating the circuitry does. It allows us to now go in, understand the physiological circuitry that is very subtly manipulated with one nucleotide variant in the human genome, and then go and turn these knobs much more severely than that one nucleotide in order to then understand the physiological process that should be manipulated and also the specific gene regulatory knobs that we can use to manipulate them. So how do we systematically do this, not just in one locus, but across tens of thousands of loci across the genome? Well, first, we need to build reference epigenomes in order to predict the disease-relevant tissues across hundreds of cell types. Number two, we need to find ways to combine genetic, epigenetic, and transcriptional variation in the context of disease to understand how the genetic variants are acting through these intermediate molecular phenotypes all the way to disease. Number three, we need to do this at single cell resolution because the different cell types of our brain, of our gut, of our liver, of our whole body are in fact extremely different from each other in these multicellular tissues and these you know, extremely complex combinations of cells. So we need to understand the epigenomic and transcriptional variation at single cell level in the context of disease. Number three, we need to actually understand those genetic effects at a cell type specific level across thousands of samples by integrating both single cell and bulk data sets in the context of disease and also in the context of EQTL studies, expression quantitative trait loci that are telling us about the molecular changes in the context of disease. We also need to do this across many phenotypes. Right now, we can't think of obesity in isolation of all of the other comorbidities that it has. We need to understand medical records systematically and be able to complete these medical records and connect them with genetics and expression. Lastly, we need to understand how exercise and obesity and schizophrenia and diabetes and Alzheimer's and neurodegeneration, in fact, converge across multiple tissues find biomarkers of obesity, of cancer, of Alzheimer's, of aging, and then use those to understand how these processes are affecting multiple tissues at the time. In order to combine all these predictions for mechanistic dissection of this gene regulatory circuitry. And we've developed a series of high throughput technologies that match the scale of our predictions in order to be able to manipulate hundreds of genes and thousands of regulatory elements in a single experiment. So let's dive right in. How do we understand the variation between different reference epigenomes in order to predict disease relevant tissues? It all starts with profiling and through a number of consortia through ENCODE, Roadmap Epigenomics, the Epigenome, uh, the Dravidis Consortium, the uh, EpiMap, <laughs> recent study integrating across genomics of gene regulation, roadmap and ENCODE, the IHEC, the International Human Epigenome Consortium, we've been able to collaborate with dozens of scientists across the world to basically profile healthy tissues from adult, embryonic, and in vitro differentiated iPSC-derived and ES embryonic stem cell-derived cells and primary cells to basically profile multiple histone modifications, open chromatin, DNA methylation, and of course the quote unquote output of transcription for each of these tissues and cell types. We've profiled many marks, which I'm gonna be color coding throughout my talk as promoter associated in red, enhancer associated in orange, transcription associated in green, repression by polycomb in gray, and heterochromatic repression in purple, as well as activation of both enhancer and promoter regions in orange, and of course, DNA accessibility and DNA methylation through multiple uh, patterns. Looking at these signatures across the genome and across many different cell types allows us to now infer where are promoter regions in red, where are enhancer regions in orange, where are transcribed regions in green? Where are repressed regions in gray? And also, how do they change across different cell types and different tissues? What you see here is that the Pax5 gene is in fact 
repressed in nearly all of the cell types and tissues where we've profiled, except for a handful where it seems to be escaping repression. What you also see is that promoters are on and ready for business, even when the genes are off, it seems like the promoters are always ready. By contrast, enhancers are extremely dynamic. You can see these orange marks coming on and off extremely dynamically across different regions of the genome. And lastly, if you are interested in a known coding region in this space, you would say, well, maybe it targets any of these nearby genes. And uh, you know, if there's genetic variants here, maybe they're acting to perturb the expression of those genes. But the dynamics give you a lot more information. They tell you that whenever this region turns on, this gene, Pax5, also turns on, suggesting that perhaps the target of this region is not one of those nearby genes, but instead this gene far away, 500,000 nucleotides away. So you can use all of this information to now start turning to how do we interpret disease associations. And specifically, we can take all of the regions of association shown here in blocks, not just with height, but with many different disorders. And all of the SNPs, the individual single nucleotide per polymorphisms in these regions, and then ask what tissues do they overlap systematically? Namely, if I take all of the variants associated with height and I overlap them with many tissues, I see that they preferentially localize in enhancers that are active in stem cells. If I take all of the genetic variants associated with type 1 diabetes and I overlap them systematically across all of the enhancers active in different tissues, I see that they systematically overlap immune enhancers active in T cells and B cells. If you take blood pressure variants, you see that the preferential overlap heart enhancers, cholesterol associated variants overlap liver enhancers, giving us a diagonal where different traits appear to be acting in different tissues based on the enrichment of their genetic variants in the enhancers active in those tissues. And this is actually real data. This is coming from one of those studies that we published in uh, the Roadmap Epigenomics Consortium showing that genetic variants associated with height are enriched specifically in embryonic stem cells. Genetic variants associated with allergies are specifically enriched in enhancers of T cells and B cells. If you look at genetic variants associated with blood pressure, the only enrichment happens in enhancers active in the left ventricle of the heart. That's the region where the blood pressure gets built up before the blood is pushed to the rest of the body. If you look at cholesterol, you see the genetic variants localized specifically in the liver enhancers. If you take type 2 diabetes and fasting glucose related traits, you see that they localize specifically in the pancreatic islets responsible for insulin secretion, which again lies at the core of type, 1, type 2 diabetes. If you look at inflammatory bowel disease, you see inflammatory, well, I would guess maybe immune cells, great. And then bowel disease, well, I would guess maybe digestive tissues. And indeed, digestive tissues also are enriched, suggesting that we can maybe now start putting some bets. Let's say Alzheimer's disease. Well, I would put all of my money in brain. So let's look at whether there's an enrichment in brain. Oh, well, it seems like I lost all of my money here. Um, so what happened here? Well, the problem is that brain is primarily composed of neurons and to some degree oligodendrocytes and astrocytes. But instead, we found that the strongest association, the strongest enrichment in the genetic variants associated with Alzheimer's disease was found in this obscure cell type profiled in ENCODE, namely the CD14 plus monocytes. These are the cells of the circulating blood and they share the same signatures as the macrophages, the tissue resident immune cells, including the tissue resident immune cells of the brain, the microglia suggesting that in fact, maybe genetic variants associated with Alzheimer's do not act in neurons and oligodendrocytes and astrocytes, but instead act specifically in the microglia. And indeed, when you sort brain cells into neurons, microglia and oligodendrocytes, what we found is that profiling H3K27 acetylation, this enhancer associated mark using chromatin immunoprecipitation we found that those genetic variants 
associated with Alzheimer's were specifically enriched in HDK27 stellation of microglia, not of neurons and not all of the dendrocytes, suggesting again that perhaps microglia and immune cells are at the basis of Alzheimer's disease. So in collaboration with Li Hui Tsai uh, and Andreas Fenning and Elizabeth uh, Joneska in um, uh, both my lab and uh, Li Hui Tsai's lab, what we found is that in fact, these epigenomic signals were conserved between mice and humans, indicating indeed an immune basis of Alzheimer's disease. In addition to this genetic signal, working with CKP25 mice in Li Hui's lab, what we found is that the early changes of Alzheimer's that happened in the first two weeks of the mouse growth were in fact implicating immune processes, but not at all neuronal processes. By contrast, the late stage Alzheimer's seen after six weeks in the CKP25 mice was in fact very strongly showing repression of neuronal processes, indicating that perhaps inflammation and immune processes are the causal component of Alzheimer's and perhaps precedes the neuronal changes that we see later on. We have since expanded this study from 127 epigenomes to 834 epigenomes. What we found is that this expands also the number of enriched traits from 54 traits to 540 traits in a paper that just appeared in Nature an hour ago, the EpiMap paper. So you can find it on my Twitter feed and hopefully in the news as well. If you look at MIT news, uh, there's a press release about it. And what we're seeing is that as you expand these epigenomic maps to hundreds of tissues, you can start doing so much more with them. First of all, you can start clustering these trait comorbidity or trait co-association map that basically tells you which pairs of traits are enriched together in similar sets of tissues and that allow you for every one of those tissues and for every one of those traits to ask what is the set of co-associations both in trait to trait, tissue to tissue and trait to tissue. What we're seeing again is that Alzheimer's localizes in immune cells. If you look at intelligence, self-reported uh, math ability, cognitive performance, math deaths, etc., as well as of course, schizophrenia, neuroticism, worry, etc. These localizing enhancers active in brain. If you look at cholesterol, you see liver. If you look at heart, you see, uh, if you look at cardiac traits like blood pressure, you see heart. But then you also see these polyfactorial traits that are sort of not localizing in these clusters, but instead are found in the intervening spaces that sometimes connect two or more of these tissues and sometimes many of these tissues. One example is coronary artery disease which in fact was the most pleiotropic trait. What we found is that coronary artery disease was associated with 19 different distinct tissues, the, by far the largest of any other trait. And that included liver, coronary artery, thyroid, adipose, and so on and so forth. Remarkably, we can actually take the full set of genetic variants associated with coronary artery disease and start partitioning them out into the subset of genetic variants that are associated with different tissues. And what we see is that if you take the subset of CAD variants that lie within liver, they're enriched in very distinct processes from the genetic variants that are associated with CAD, but localizing coronary artery. You see here phospholipid transport, uh, muscle adaptation versus heart coagulation, chemotaxis, and so on and so forth and so on and so forth for each of these tissues. Every single one of those tissues partitions this extremely complex trait into individual tissue specific parts. And those tissue specific parts are in fact showing enrichment and co-association with very distinct sets of traits that are comorbid with coronary artery disease, such as HDL cholesterol, atrial fibrillation, waist to hip ratio, and so on and so forth. So that basically allows us to now start dissecting these traits into specific components based on these global enrichments. But we don't have to do that just at the global enrichments. We can also do that at the single locus level. We can actually go into the top genome-wide association study loci that are associated with coronary artery disease and then ask, well, what do they overlap in each of these regions? And what we're seeing is 
examples of both liver only function and heart only function. Here's the first one, PCSK9. This is one of the most famous associations with um, heart disease. And this actually, after a good you know, decade, became one of the first targets for coronary artery disease. And you can see here that our study shows that of all of the genetic variants, there's exactly one that lies, that, that of course is actually the strongest genetic variance associated with coronary artery disease in this locus, and by far higher than all the other ones, suggesting that it's possibly the causal one. And that in fact sits within a liver specific enhancer, which is linked using liver specific gene links between enhancers and their target genes that specifically target PCSK9, the gene that is now real, recognized to be the target for coronary artery disease. Here's another example where you see two regions of association in the same disease locus. One contains many scattered variants instead of the single variant that you, set, you, that you have here. And the other one contains also many scattered variants. So two regions, each with multiple variants. But what's really interesting is that both regions are active in the coronary artery and both regions are linked to this EDNRA gene through multiple links, indicating this pleiotropy of multiple uh, variants acting together and converging onto the same target gene. Here's another example where you would e expect a liver specific function based on these associations. But in fact, when you dive in, you see also these heart specific links to a separate gene. There's two genes here that are divergently transcribed from the same region. And these many, many associations scattered across multiple enhancers are linked through both the liver and the heart to two different processes. So we just published this study, but the data has been around for more than a year now through this website that you can go and browse for not just these three loci, but for 30,000 regions. So for 30,000 loci for one quarter of all of the GWAS association results, you can in fact see these uh, associations systematically. You can also browse all of the motif, uh, the gene enhancer links, the enrichments, uh, the specific data sets and so on and so forth. So this is all using reference epigenomes to predict disease relevant tissues by systematically annotating the non-coding elements across many cell types and then recognizing this immune causal basis of Alzheimer's and many, many other disorders. But everything I've told you so far is assuming that all of us in this chat room have the same epigenome. But of course the epigenome varies dramatically from person to person. So we can't just simply say, oh, we've got the heart epigenome, we're done. We actually have to profile how the heart epigenome changes from person to person and how those changes are associated with both genetic variation, transcriptional variation, and disease variation. So that's what we did next. We basically said, can we now bridge the very, very long gap between genetic variants and disease? How? By profiling the intermediate molecular changes that are happening on the way to disease. So if you have a genetic variant associated with Alzheimer's, that genetic variant plays a tiny, tiny little role in Alzheimer's. Why? Because there are thousands of variants that are co-associated each of which has these weak effects that we talked about earlier. But when you start looking at these intermediate molecular phenotypes, you can find that the effects can actually be greater now at the enhancer level, at the gene expression level, and even at the endophenotype level. The challenge, of course, with these intermediate molecular phenotypes is that these beautiful unidirectional arrows that come out of genetics are no longer unidirectional when they connect these intermediate phenotypes. Why? Because the gene expression change might simply be a consequence of disease, or it just might be a consequence of the environment that both changes the expression of that gene and changes the disease. It could also simply be that this gene is actually fighting the disease rather than contributing to the disease if you see a correlation between the two, giving us no hint as to the directionality of function. So what we need to do is develop new methods for systematically understanding the path of causality by exploiting the fact that we have genetic associations and therefore unidirectional arrows 
coming out of these inherited variants and the disease phenotypes. Namely, the disease phenotype is not what caused you to inherit that variant, it's always the other way around. So we can use that to get causality and unidirectionality back into these arrows. How do we do that? By systematically asking how genetic variation correlates with both epigenomic and transcriptional variation, and ultimately with phenotypic variation. So we've done that systematically across human brain in collaboration with David Bennett and Phil de Jaeger, who's previously at HMS and now in Columbia, and David Bennett from the Rush University. So David established this religious order study and this memory and aging project cohort, which are longitudinal cohorts of aging that have followed patients for more than 20 years with cognitive evaluations. And all of these patients donated their brain post-mortem, enabling us to infer methylation, transcription, genotype, and dozens of other phenotypic variables, both at the molecular and at the cellular level. So what we can do now is start asking, how are the two correlated between genome, the epigenome, but also transcriptome and phenotype? So first, we're going to look at the correlation between genetic variation and the epigenome to discover methylation quantitative trait loci. These are quantitative traits, namely the amount of methylation, Loci, these are the SNPs that control methylation. And then a quantitative trait locus is um, a SNP that doesn't act on the phenotype directly, but instead acts at these intermediate molecular phenotypes such as methylation. So let's look at this correlation to discover methylation QTLs. What we find is in fact 50,000 significant methylation QTLs across the genome after Bonferroni correction. You can see here this little faint red line, that's the genome wide significance threshold at 10 to the minus 10. At the top, you have 10 to the minus 300. These are astronomical p-values, actually way more than the number of atoms in the uh, universe. So astronomical does not do it justice. And are these uh, telling us something? Absolutely. They're basically telling us that the genetics of that locus at conception for this individual allows us to predict the methylation level at 93 years of age for that same individual in an inaccessible tissue. So we don't have to profile methylation to know, uh, you know that person's brain molecular signature. What we can do is simply look at their genotype and in fact predict it. And that's true for tens of thousands of loci across the genome. That allows us to do something very, very cool we can actually take genetic variants and instead of associating them with disease directly, we can associate them with methylation to look at how we can in fact predict methylation and not just get the observed methylation, but the imputed methylation. And why is the imputed methylation so cool? Because it's the genetic component of methylation. It's not all of methylation, it's just whatever I can predict from the genome. Why is that important? Because when I do a methylome-wide association study, instead of genome-wide association study, I can do a methylome-wide association study between methylation and disease. I can do that in 100 individuals or 300 individuals for whom I've measured both the methylation and the disease status, of course, post-mortem. But then once I've inferred these signatures, I can do that not just for those individuals, but for 74,000 individuals for whom I have both genetics and disease because I can systematically predict the imputed methylation, namely the genetic component of methylation. And what's really important here is that while MWAS is a bidirectional arrow because some of those methylation changes might be downstream of disease, the imputed MWAS is in fact a unidirectional arrow because it tells me the association between the genetic component and disease. And therefore this is what I could predict at birth and therefore it's not likely to be simply a, con a downstream consequence of disease and of the environment. So we can actually now get the genetic component of methylation and paint causal paths to disease. And when we do that, we actually find that there are many more additional regions that are associated with disease in a genome-wide fashion. Here in all of chromosome six, you see that there are no genome-wide significant hits. The strongest one is below the five times 10 to minus eight genome wide significance threshold. But instead, when I combine multiple of these genetic variants together, I can start predicting the level of methylation for these individuals. 
And that level of methylation after bone furanic correction has now half a dozen genome-wide significant hits in this region. And I can do that not just between genetics and disease through methylation. I can also do that through transcription, either directly or through methylation and transcription jointly. That allows us to now start predicting systematically not just genome-wide significant loci, but also sub-threshold loci in gray that are associated with disease. And for each of those loci, start predicting the driver genes, the directionality of effect above or below the axis as protective or risk-inducing, and also the heritability captured for each of those in the size of the circle, and whether they are in genome-wide significant loci in purple or sub-threshold loci in gray. And we now have 206 genes that are predicted to significantly mediate the risk for Alzheimer's through their expression levels. So this is all looking at genetic, epigenetic, and transcriptional variation in disease at the level of whole tissues. But again, as we mentioned earlier, the brain is extremely diverse in the cell types. So what we've switched to since you know, a couple of years ago is single cell dissection of these epigenomic and transcriptional changes in the context of disease. We basically started looking at a number of traits, not just Alzheimer's. We looked at Alzheimer's frontotemporal dementia, Lewy body dementia, ALS, Huntington's, uh, psychosis in AD, schizophrenia, bipolar, Down syndrome, autism, depression, suicide, PTSD, and aging, each across dozens of individuals, summing up to 1,500 post-mortem brain samples each in multiple uh, cell types and a total of now more than 20 million cells profiling both single cell RNA and single cell DNA accessibility based on this new assay for transposase accessible chromatin, which allows you to carry this out at single cell resolution. And we've profiled a total of seven different brain regions associated with these disorders. What are we finding? In the first paper that we just published a year ago in Nature, uh, in collaboration with Li Hui Tai, Hans Reddy Matis, and Jose Davila, and Shaheen Mohammadi, what we found is that there's a tremendous heterogeneity in the changes that we see in Alzheimer's disease. There's a lot of cell type diversity, distinguishing excitatory neurons, inhibitory neurons, oligodendrocyte progenitor cells, oligodendrocytes, microglia, endothelial cells and vascular cells, astrocytes. And every dot here is a cell. And you can see here how the cells cluster by their cell type primarily. But you can also see that across different individuals, there are quite dramatic changes in the subset of excitatory neurons that are associated with each of those. And in fact, if you correlate these differences with the phenotypic signatures of these individuals, distinguishing 24 non-AD individuals that show high cognitive function and very low pathology, but also mild cognitive impairment individuals for early Alzheimer's and then severe Alzheimer's where you see a lot of neurofibrillary tangles, a lot of amyloid plaques, as well as a lot of cognitive decline. What you see is this shift in the expression profiles affecting not just the microglia, but every single one of those major cell types indicating systemic global changes associated with transcriptional differences in disease. So we can now take those healthy and risk individuals, cluster all of the cells, associate them with all of the different cell types and start asking systematically, what are the clusters that emerge from a purely de novo clustering of those cells? And what's really remarkable is that what we find when we subcluster excitatory neurons is clusters that are associated with high and low amyloid individuals. Inhibitory neurons, same thing. Astrocyte, same thing. It seems that every major cell type has global transcriptional signatures that are associated with these changes in the context of disease. And we see this with amyloid, with BRAC stage, with cognitive decline, with overall variable for AD. But what we also see is that these cell types are in fact associated with male versus female individuals showing dramatically different fra fractions of the different subcell types. Female individuals show many more excitatory neurons that are disease associated versus, versus non-disease associated 
And the same thing for astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, disease, microglia, and so on and so forth. So that basically tells us that female individuals have basically a preponderance of disease-associated cells, of these pathogenic signature cells. And we can see that the processes that are changing in female individuals are dramatically different from the processes in male individuals. We can also start seeing the differences that are happening in early versus late Alzheimer's. We see that the changes that the, the genes that are increasing in expression early in Alzheimer's are extremely cell type specific and pointing to very different processes. The genes that are increasing late in Alzheimer's are very shared and very often associated with damage. If you look at male versus female differences, you see that excitatory neurons have 3,000 genes that are differentially expressed before AD and 6,000 genes that are differentially expressed after AD, suggesting that there are many cell, cell type specific and sex specific signatures of Alzheimer's and perhaps our therapeutic targeting approach should actually be tailored to those differences. In fact, we're seeing that oligodendrocytes are dramatically shifting in male individuals and upregulating myelination processes that are protecting and coding the neurons. Whereas the same thing is not happening in female individuals. When we look at the pathology for male versus female individuals, we're finding that the female individuals show a lot more white matter loss than the male individuals, indicating that these expression signatures are in fact reflected at the physiological level. Since our first study of Alzheimer's, we've now scaled to many, many more individuals. We've looked at many more conditions and many more brain regions, a total of 1,500 postmortem brain samples across single cell RNA and single cell attack profiling. Just a few months ago, we published this uh, paper on schizophrenia that you're welcome to uh, check out. Uh, and it's on, bio, it's on MedArchive. And what we see is, uh, again, in this first single cell dissection of schizophrenia, what we see is that we can in fact distinguish many different subtypes of excitatory and of inhibitory neurons, and even some cellular states that cross cut across these different cell types. We find this SDTR cell state and this neurogrenin associated cell state, which are in fact appear to be playing an important role in schizophrenia. In particular, if you look at the uh, global transcriptional changes that we see between schizophrenia individuals and controlled individuals. And you start asking for what are the global expression changes that are associated with schizophrenia? What you see is that all of these schizophrenic individuals are showing these global signatures of schizophrenia, except for one whose son actually turns out to be schizophrenic. So maybe this is a case where there are other mechanisms of resilience perhaps. But on the other side of the spectrum, you see multiple individuals that are clearly schizophrenic at the phenotypic level, but whose global transcriptional signatures are in fact not associated with schizophrenia. Those individuals show a very strong abundance of this SCTR cell type, this cell state, suggesting that in fact, there might be two different paths to schizophrenia, one through the global dysregulatory changes and one through this SCTR cell state that is significantly associated with schizophrenia. So what that tells us is that we may have a mechanism that explains why in bulk RNA sequencing studies, we don't see any expression changes for some individuals. And the reason is that they're perhaps happening in only one very specific cell state. More globally, we can start looking at all of the genetic regions that are associated with schizophrenia and start asking whether there are gene expression changes that are linked to these regions through high C, namely through this chromatin conformation capture, this folding of these regulatory regions with their target genes together to start predicting what are putative target genes 
for those genetic loci. So here I'm showing the Manhattan plot for uh, schizophrenia laid on its side. And for every one of those loci, we basically have nearby genes, many of which in gray are linked through this chromatin conformation capture. Others are neighboring based on genomic proximity. And whether those genes are in fact more highly expressed in schizophrenia or more highly expressed in controls, giving us a directionality of effect for coordinating targeted perturbation of those genes. And also the cell type where the maximum expression change was found, enabling us to now target those potential therapeutics to specific biological processes associated with those cell types. We see that this SDTR cell state is in fact very strongly associated with multiple gene expression changes in disease, giving us perhaps candidate genes for this additional association for schizophrenia and excitatory and inhibitory neurons to a lower degree are associated, whereas these glial cell types do not appear to be underlying schizophrenia. Our single cell studies also allow us to go and understand the downstream processes, but also the upstream regulators associated with these gene expression changes. And what we're seeing is that globally, we find that neurodevelopment, synaptic signaling and synaptic organization are systematically disrupted in schizophrenia. But when you look at the dysregulation of the corresponding upstream regulators, then the strongest enrichment is very much neurodevelopment, suggesting that in fact, the regulators upstream of those genes might be acting early in embryo development and not simply coming on in adult tissues. We can start clustering together these regulators into modules based on their co-expression pattern across different neuronal cell types and across all individuals in our study. And we can in fact group together multiple of these seemingly distinct modules. And one of those modules in particular appears to be overlapping very strongly with another module, ME37, that was discovered in, modern, in second code in, um, in the context of neurodevelopment. And that module contains several transcription factors that are associated with schizophrenia, several tra transcription factors that are associated with um, NDD, and also is associated with uh, genome-wide association studies for both schizophrenia and major depression disorder. And what we're seeing is that these transcription factors are in fact appearing to be active both early in development and during adulthood specifically for the neurogranin and for the SCTR cell state. We've also looked at ALS and FTD and uh, how these uh, signatures are changing specifically in the frontal cortex and in the motor cortex, which is known to be associated with ALS changes. And we're finding a large number of biological processes that are dramatically different between FTD and ALS, but also quite a certain amount of convergence between the two. When we look at Huntington's disease, we find that the distinction, the transcriptional distinction between direct pathway and indirect pathway spinal projection neurons, which are very important in the striatum and associated with Huntington's disease, appears to be lost in Huntington's where these two cell states are merging when they are quite distinct in control uh, subjects. We're also able to see systematic differences at the single cell level between different regions of the brain. If we look at prefrontal cortex, mid temporal cortex, angular gyrus, and many of these uh, neocortical regions, we're finding quite similar expression patterns for both neurons and glial cell. But if you start looking at many of these subcortical regions, it appears that neurons have dramatically different signatures from each other and from the neocortex, indicating a high level of specialization at the gene expression patterns in the same way that we see a lot of specialization in the specific morphology of these subcortical neurons. We're also seeing that these are dramatically associated with changes that are measured at the region level for both neurofibular entangles and for neuritic plaques. And while we certainly would expect excitatory and inhibitory neurons to be dramatically different between different brain regions, we also find that even astrocytes and even glial cells are in fact dramatically different between the different brain regions indicating a lot of brain specialization, even for the glial cells. Going below this region level resolution to sub-regional resolution, we're able to 
dive into the hippocampal formation substructures, including the dentate gyrus, CA1, CA234, the stubiculum, as well as the uh, neighboring region of the entorhinal cortex, to start asking whether the expression patterns of individual neurons are in fact reminiscent of their um, morphological differences and whether they cluster cells according to their distinct morphology. And indeed, granule cells versus pyramidal cells associated with the dentate gyrus or the subiculum, as you would expect from their morphology, so dramatically different in expression changes. But what was really striking is that we can actually tell apart CA1 from CA3. We can tell apart specific subregions of the entorhinal cortex according to their proximity. And if you look at the geographical location of these regions within the hippocampal formation and within our single cell expression patterns, you see that in fact, the expression profiles are giving us spatial transcriptomic information that is simply not accessible if, um, if you just look at these global expression patterns. And that allows us to actually start distinguishing how these different brain regions are predictive of Alzheimer's disease. And what we're finding is that CA1, 2, 3, 4 are in fact much more predictive of Alzheimer's than the dentate gyrus, suggesting that there's in fact a spatial uh, organization into how these regions are associated with Alzheimer's disease. Building on this work, we've now started profiling systematically spatial transcriptomics in the context of both healthy and disease samples. And what we're finding is that in uh, SCA1, a disease that is known to affect the cerebellum and specifically the Purkinje cells within the cerebellum, you see this very dramatic alteration in the spatial profiles that lose a lot of their organization and that lose also a lot of their cell type proportion differences associated with Purkinje cells. And this is not visible if you just look at the marker genes of recurrency cells and specifically PPP1R17 expression, but it is dramatically visible if you actually take what I call these mini ball profiles for every single one of these dots in the spatial transcriptomics experiment, you have a mixture of cell types, but we've used CDC to deconvolve these mixtures into individual cell expression patterns and what we're seeing is in fact that the proportion of recurrency cells as expected biologically is in fact dramatically altered in SCA1, but the cell type expression, the cell type specific marker expression is simply not showing this. Going beyond this deconvolution of the spatial transcriptomics from mini bulk experiments to single cells, we also want to do the converse. Inspired by the hippocampus study, we want to now systematically predict and augment single cell expression patterns with their spatial coordinates. To do this, Juna and Na in our group have basically trained a deep learning model to predict the spatial positioning information from single cell data. And they are basically taking the single cell data using a deep learning framework to project it onto a three dimensional coordinate space with only the information that the pairwise distances between pairs of cells in that three-dimensional space should mirror the original pairwise distances found in a control experiment with spatial transcriptomics and single cell transcriptomics. That allows them to now systematically start augmenting millions of single cell expression patterns into their spatial coordinates, finding that we can recapitulate the spatial coordinate gradient across different layers of the cortex for the excitatory neurons, but also that oligodendrocytes and astrocytes that again are not thought to be spatially organized are in fact showing a lot of spatial information that recapitulates what is actually observed in, um, in the expression uh, experiments. Going beyond just uh, these large classes of cells such as microglia, we can actually start dissecting subclasses of microglia and start distinguishing inflammatory versus synaptic microglia, as well as homeostatic, pro-inflammatory, you know, ma uh, disease-associated macrophages and other immune cells in the brain, each with their own 
signatures of marker genes and each with their own functional domains. And what we're finding quite dramatically is that these inflammatory microglia are dramatically associated with Alzheimer's disease, both at the RNA level and at the attack level, whereas these synaptic microglia are dramatically altered in schizophrenia and also associated with GWAS variants with schizophrenia uh, associations in their single cell attack profiles, suggesting in fact that we can start uncoupling the separate processes of microglia acting in neurodegenerative versus psychiatric disorders. We've also systematically started looking at the accessibility of these regions across the genome using single cell attack. And what you can see here is the correlation between single cell attack and RNA expression, enabling us to start linking together non-coding variants associated with schizophrenia with candidate target genes based on these correlation analysis that I showed you earlier between tissues, but now at the level of individual cell types. We find some quite dramatic examples of coordinated changes between RNA expression shown here in these um, barbs, uh, in this box and whisker plot, and the amount of DNA accessibility shown here in these genomic profiles for both control individuals and for Alzheimer's individuals. And what you can see is that, for example, TMSB4X shows decreased expression in Alzheimer's in um, Alzheimer's individual versus controls. And the same thing is found for the accessibility of the corresponding gene at the single cell attack level. And same thing for astrocytes and RL RLPD1, for APOE and microglia, and for metal 47A uh, and oligodendrocytes. You see these coordinated changes between RNA and DNA accessibility. And we can see this systematically across, for example, all astrocytes in this picture with genes that show coordinated changes uh, between Alzheimer's in the arrow and controls in the circle, both on the RNA level on the x-axis and on the DNA level accessibility on the y-axis. You see these coordinated changes for many of these genes, but you also see changes that are happening at the RNA level, even when the corresponding DNA region does not change in accessibility. Using the same technique as we saw earlier of the global enrichment for epigenomic regions, but now inferred through the single cell DNA accessibility profiles projected onto the different neuronal and glial cell types, we see that schizophrenia uh, genetic variants localize very specifically in excitatory and inhibitory neurons, and same thing for many other psychiatric disorders, whereas immune and Alzheimer's genetic variants localized very specifically in the microglia, consistent with immune functions, as we had seen before, but now looking specifically at the microglia and looking at single cell resolution. That allows us to now start dissecting the candidate variants that are associated with these changes uh, that are associated with Alzheimer's disease, for example, in the PICOM1 gene. You see this genetic variant that localizes specifically in this microglia enhancer, which is overlapping an SPI1, also known as PU.1 motif, a master regulator of microglia and also immune cells. And this is very strongly enriched across the genome for microglial peaks. We can also go beyond the gene expression changes and start inferring directly from the RNA sequencing information, somatic mutations that are happening in each of these cells based on the direct sequencing of their exomes from the single cell RNA-seq data. And what we're finding, looking at this study of mosaicism and somatic mutations, is that the somatic mutational burden increases in Alzheimer's. It is found specifically within a class of neurons that appear to be disease-associated and possibly DNA damage-associated, and it is higher in the glial cells that continue dividing than in the neuronal cells that are post-mitotic. We see differences between AD and non-AD individuals, differences between male and female individuals. And we're also seeing convergence of many of these mutations in common biological processes that are highly distinct between different cell types. That allows us to now start predicting these clonal expansions of these uh, mutations affecting multiple cells of the same individual.
Everything I've showed you so far has looked at single cell expression changes, but hasn't yet associated these changes with, expression, with genetic differences between individuals. So to do this, Young Jin Park and Liang He and the group basically took our single cell profiles across a limited number of individuals and bulk expression profiles across 3,000 individuals and combined both with the genetics of those individuals to look systematically for cell fraction QTLs, for cell type specific differential genes that are driven by expression, by, by genetic variation, and also for cell type specific eQTLs in a paper that we just posted on BioArchive a week ago. What we're finding is that excitatory neurons increase in abundance between those individuals based on the deconvolved profiles uh, with uh, cognitive function, but decrease with cognitive decline. And conversely, astrocytes show the opposite uh, change. We're seeing that neurons, uh, in fact, decrease in abundance dramatically between AD and non-AD individuals, and also decrease in abundance with increasing ages. As the individuals age, their fraction of neurons, in fact, uh, decreases dramatically. We can also see genetic variants associated with these expression, sorry, with these cell type proportion differences, namely cell type fraction QTLs. And one of those is particularly intriguing as it is localized within this TMM106B gene, which has been previously shown to have a role in frontal temporal lobal degeneration, but is not associated with AD or with BRAC stage or with amyloid, suggesting in fact that this gene might actually play a role in decreasing the fraction of neurons, which then has a compounded effect with the other changes seen in Alzheimer's disease. And the molecular function of that variant appears to be a change in the three-dimensional structure of this region by disrupting a CTCF motif, which are involved in setting up these high C loops. Across the full gene set, we find that microglial gene expression changes are very strongly associated with these EQTLs in the context of Alzheimer's GWAS, once more confirming that the genetic variants are predominantly acting in microglia even though the global gene expression changes are then seen later on in the disease in additional cell types. Going beyond the simple definition of Alzheimer's disease, this monolithic definition, we've basically broken up the three different signatures of Alzheimer's into A beta, amyloid beta, neurofibrillary tangles and, and tau, and also neuroinflammation. And then looked at the subset of genetic regions across the genome whose epigenetic signatures are differential in each of those traits with each of these phenotypes. And what we're finding is that these allow us to now subdivide the genome into nine different clusters that show distinct associations with different combinations of these phenotypes. And those nine clusters are in fact associated in both promoters and enhancers with very different activity patterns across our reference epigenome maps. Cluster three, cluster two here shows an enrichment for embryonic stem cell enhancers. Clusters eight and nine show an enrichment for immune enhancers and different clusters for fetal, adult, and heart enhancers. And the pathways associated with these subsets of the genome are also dramatically different, suggesting that in fact, Alzheimer's might actually be made up of a combination of multiple signatures rather than just one monolithic profile. Taking this to the next level with ULE, we basically started analyzing the comorbidity patterns of uh, thousands of phenotypic variables from the electronic health record of millions of individuals in a paper that we just published in Nature Communications a few months ago. And looking at how we can in fact discover groups of phenotypically similar individuals by combining multiple different types of information between ICD-9 billing codes, lab tests, prescriptions, doctor notes, and DRG codes for uh, in, a, in a hierarchical model that allows us to now combine the non-missing at random property of many of these lab tests, for example, that are only prescribed when you expect an abnormal test, enabling us to now start imputing these electronic health records with great accuracy. This allows us to correct 
many mistakes in the elect electronic health records, but also to complete them systematically. And in collaboration with Nikos Deskalakis at McLean Hospital, discover combinations of individuals that show similar phenotypic signatures and whose imputed expression by looking at the genotype of these individuals and EQTLs from the GTEx study to start understanding what are the tissues where these expression differences are most pronounced. And surprisingly, we're finding that the brain is actually superseded by whole blood where many of these expression changes are happening, indicating potentially an immune role also underlying PTSD, something that has been previously suggested in the literature. In the last section, I'm gonna to talk to you about our multi-tissue convergence of these changes across multiple uh, different disorders. In the context of exercise and obesity, we basically started collaborating with Lydia Lynch and Laurie Goodyear and many others uh, in the Jocelyn Diabetes Center and at the Harvard Medical School. And in collaboration with Novo Nordisk and uh, led by Jackie Yang and Leandra Gundelo to start looking at how is exercise affecting all of these different tissues and how is it combating the effects of diet-induced obesity in each of these tissues? So looking at four tissues in our initial study, looking at both uh, diet and exercise interventions across 300,000 cells, we're able to now discover for each of these tissues, different subsets of immune cells and stromal cells. And what we're seeing is dramatic changes in the abundance of those cell types for uh, high fat diet or uh, diet and exercise interventions. We're also able to distinguish different regions of the intestine, for example, based on their single cell expression profiles and based on specific marker genes that paint early versus late. And we're also able to distinguish differences in immune cell abundance associated with different tissues. Quite dramatically, we're finding that exercise training alters both adipocyte stem cells and immune cell cell types in both visceral white adipose tissue, but also in subcutaneous adipose tissue, quite strikingly with different and opposing effects, suggesting that in fact, both training and exercise are pushing these expression profiles in actually opposite directions. We're also seeing that these exercise changes are in fact reprogramming the expression of both adipocyte stem cells and immune cells quite dramatically and quite more than all of the other cell types, indicating that both adipocyte stem cells that I mentioned earlier in my talk, when I was talking about the early adipocyte differentiation, where this lineage commitment decision is made between fat burning and fat storing cells, we're seeing that the, th that the same thermogenic processes are dramatically differentially expressed in response to exercise in both the adipocyte stem cells and in multiple other tissues, including muscle. We're also finding that the training exercise reverses the within tissue interactions that are induced by high fat diet. Namely during high fat diet, there's an increase in the interaction between both uh, immune cells and adipocyte uh, regulatory cells. And those interactions are extremely abundant with high fat diet, but then you know, sort of lowered again with exercise, indicating again, once more a reversal, but now at the level of cell-cell interactions. Going beyond uh, obesity to Alzheimer's, we basically found that we can use blood biomarkers of Alzheimer's by profiling H3K27 acetylation in the blood and deconvolving these expression profiles into the different cell types to ask how are these patterns pointing to enrichments for specific cell types. And what we're seeing is that the macrophages are in fact showing the strongest enrichment in this deconvolution, again, reminiscent of this role for immune cells underlying uh, the microglia in Alzheimer's disease. So exactly perhaps these changes that we're finding in Alzheimer's might be in part driven by microglia, but also in part driven by monocytes in the circulating blood. In fact, these epigenomic biomarkers of AD are allowing us to predict AD in those individuals with an area under the, the curve of more than 80% accuracy by combining these multiple markers 
And many of these marker genes are in fact already known to be associated with Alzheimer's through genome-wide association studies, again, indicating that they might in fact be acting in the blood. Taking this biomarker study to the whole transcriptome and the whole epigenome, we are able to build a molecular signature of aging rate by looking at the chronological age that we can computationally predict through the expression patterns of those individuals versus the biological age of those individuals. And this delta age between the two, we have now used as a phenotype, enabling us to predict faster aging versus slower aging individuals. That showed us that in fact, APOE4 and aging rate appear to be independent contributors to Alzheimer's disease, enabling us in fact to increase our predictive value quite dramatically by combining the two. We just published a study a few weeks ago on um, exosomes as a cancer biomarker of uh, metastatic melanoma, enabling us to actually see an inaccessible tissue through these blood vesicles that contain RNA from the tumor and from other inaccessible cells. So that allows us to now start predicting both the mutational load of these tumors through their exosomal RNA-seq and through whole exome sequencing. And we've also studied the convergence of these disparate mutations in the gene regulatory plexus of uh, these cancer-associated genes from very distal regulatory elements, enabling us to start predicting these long-range interactions that sometimes implicate multiple chromosomes, which we have found very surprising. And we have also um, studied experimentally through a bio in, in a bioarchive paper that we posted uh, with uh, Richard Salari. We've also looked at the progression of these changes in a longitudinal fashion during the course of immunotherapy and looking at convergent changes that are happening in multiple tumor lineages that are coexisting in multiple biopsies from the same patient over time, enabling us to find these convergence uh, events such as genome doubling or these deactivation of specific genes. We've now combined all of these computational and experimental studies of systematic profiling of disease changes to start predicting driver genes in a number of those cell types. We can now predict what are the genes that are underlying each of these conditions and what cell type are they acting in, enabling us to now start perturbing them systematically in collaboration with uh, Kevin Egan at Harvard and Maria Kusti in my lab and Kevin Smith in his lab, we've basically started imaging in uh, high throughput the synaptic connections of these uh, perturbations of those driver genes in cell cultures. And we're finding dramatic alterations for many of them using CRISPR perturbations of uh, these target genes. We've started building these modular and programmable CRISPR-Cas9 and CRISPR-DEAD-Cas9 systems for perturbing both the genes themselves, their promoters, as well as editing individual SNPs, but also activating or repressing individual enhancers by coupling an inactive form of Cas9 that does not cut the DNA, but uses these guide RNAs to now target either activating factors like P300 or repressive factors like CRAB to specific regions of the genome to turn on or turn off specific enhancers. We can do this targeting in iPSC cells and then differentiate these lineages to start studying across neurons, microglia, astrocytes, and oligodendrocytes, the specific lineage commitment stage where these regions become active and where these variants show their effects. In collaboration with Kevin Egan, we've basically done calcium signaling and synaptic imaging across uh, multi-well plates to start testing these uh, multiple cells and multiple gene perturbations systematically. And in collaboration with Melina Klausenter and uh, Shushen, uh, sorry, Xinchen Wang, we basically uh, developed a new technology called Hydra that combines DNA accessibility and self-transcribing reporter assays in plasmids and computational methods for inferring high resolution where these signals are coming from to test in a single experiment 7 million regions of the DNA 
and their ability to drive enhancer activity. By systematically cutting these regions out of the DNA, inserting them into plasmids, which are self-transcribing because they are downstream of the, uh, in the UTR, downstream of the translation stop site, but upstream of the transcription stop site, enabling us to now use these elements to both drive expression and to use them as barcodes by sequencing them systematically and then inferring in 7 million different fragments what is the difference of intensity across those different fragments across the genome, enabling us to pinpoint the region of activity to very specific high resolution driver elements which overlap with evolutionary conservation and with regulatory motifs. In collaboration with Andreas Penning, we're now using these constructs in the post sorry, in the live mice, in the brains of mice, to basically understand the in vivo context in which those genetic variants act and where they have an effect, both in microglia as well as in uh, neuronal cells. So I'll stop there and see if there's any uh, questions. Uh, to summarize briefly, what I've told you about is number one, the goal of dissecting these disease regions systematically by building reference epigenomes to predict disease relevant tissues, by combining genetic, epigenetic and transcriptional variation in disease, by dissecting at the single cell resolution, these epigenomic and transcriptional changes, again, in the context of inter-individual variation and disease variation, how we can combine single cell data and bulk data through deconvolution to understand the cell type specific genetic effects of these um, disease associated variants across genome wide association studies and also studies of quantitative trait loci for expression or methylation. How we can combine multiple phenotypes together in the context of medical record, imputation, and integration with expression. And then how both diet and exercise have these multi tissue convergent effects in obesity but also the convergence of multiple genes in cancer and the biomarkers of aging and of cancer. And lastly, I've talked to you about the high throughput dissection of the gene regulatory circuits. Uh, this is a wonderful collaboration with many labs, including uh, Li Wei Tsai's lab, Melina Klausnitscher, who now has her own lab, and many of the folks have now moved on to start their own labs in many places. So we're always looking for great computational postdocs, but also great experimental postdocs. So if you're looking for uh, making contribution in this superb, rapidly changing field, uh, please come join us. So I'll stop there and then uh, see if there's any questions. Thank you so much. Uh, such a fascinating talk. And I, I love how you break down at each level because uh, every, everything has to sort of, you know, disease emerges on, on many different levels. Um, from, from, from a physics perspective, I, I love the the circuitry too. Awesome. Uh, so let me, I don't know if you can see the, the questions, but I can start going through them. So uh, Rob, yeah, I can read them if you want. Well, uh, you, you can read them if you I'll like. Just, I'll just dive in. Um, so I'm starting with the top uh, upvoted one. So Rob Oakley is asking, could you give us an insight into potential personalized medicines for patients based on your group's work? So what is the, the, so I want to distinguish two things. On one hand, we have uh, precision medicine. On the other hand, we have personalized medicine. In my view, precision medicine is the first step. Precision medicine basically says, we're not going to understand the circuitry of these regions, and we're going to dissect the circuitry to, to help every patient based on the common pathways that are found across these people. Personalized medicine is slightly different. Basically says, based on that person's genotype or phenotype, we're not going to now intervene in a different way for every person. Now, personalized medicine can be guided by the genome. And that's where whole genome sequencing, that's where rare variants, that's where strong effect exonic variants come in. Because the weak variants that we've been talking about have a relatively modest effect. And therefore, for any one individual, they will not necessarily be as predictive for personalized medicine. But you can actually use other biomarkers. You can basically say, well, based on my classification of patients, I found that this particular gene expression level correlates with that class of individuals. So now you can go personalized, not from the genome, but from the concomitant signatures that we can measure in the blood or in an MRI or in an other kind of you know, uh, 
endophenotype or other sort of molecular phenotype. So I think that would be the direction with which we can, uh, we can sort of move to both precision medicine and also personalized medicine. So uh, how can this technology be manifested in real life treatments? So um, I, I want to warn people that the path from having a target to actually having a therapy can take upwards of 10 years. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's quite amazing that we have a, a, you know, a vaccine or like five vaccines for uh, SARS-CoV-2 in the span of only a few months. Uh, this is something unprecedented, but uh, you know, the, the, the typical course is um, very, very lengthy. So uh, we are hoping that many of our um, insights will be translated to therapeutics. We're working very closely with pharma partners to make sure that this actually does happen rather than just publishing the results and hoping that somebody will pay attention. We're, you're, you know, we're actively working in a series of collaborations to do that. And uh, we're, you know, we're hoping to report back, but it's gonna be a long uh, and arduous process. John Mason is asking, how do you anticipate being able to monitor and manage the unanticipated unintended consequences of genomic smart interventions on a cellular level that may later result in unknown unknowns in adverse wider physiological effects? Is this a risk worth taking on human populations? It's an enormously important ethical question. I mean, um, it's obviously not to be taken lightly. Oh, I want, uh, you know, blonde hair. Great. Let me edit my DNA. I mean, that's ridiculous. Of course, you're never going to do that. Uh, but um, there are RNA targeting CRISPR enzymes that allow us to have uh, something that does not enter the germline, obviously. And of course, the severity of the disease will sometimes call for some of these experimental treatments that may of course have adverse reactions. So for obesity, I would never say go and edit a person's DNA uh, because um, it is not an immediately life-threatening situation. But for uh, you know, congenital disorders, for many other disorders, many groups are now working on actually uh, you know, having these, these kinds of drastic interventions. As for side effects, I mean, of course, uh, we, we are extremely early in this game. The dangers are enormous. I mean, editing the human germline is something that, you know, I think the scientific community has very clearly and openly spoken against, uh, and I feel very wisely, because the risks far, far outweigh the benefits at, at this time. Um, in the future, this is something that, again, we can revisit based on the safety of these technologies, based on increased understanding about the off-target effects and also the on-target effects of these uh, interventions. But in the meantime, uh, all of these methods that I've presented are giving us handles for intervening, not just at the genomic level, but handles for intervening at the transcriptional level, at the protein level, at the cellular level, and so on and so forth. So, you know, for example, if you, if you look at FTO, you know, we don't want to go and edit the RS142185 variant. What we want to do is figure out how to manage thermogenesis and how to manage IRX3 and RX5 over stimulation. And if we can do that, we can basically reverse the disease phenotypes downstream of the genetic change. And that's sort of what I think uh, everything that my work is pointing towards leading to. We don't want to change human DNA. What we want to do is change the circuits that are downstream of these DNA changes. And those are going to have much more drastic effects than editing the DNA. If you, you know, even if we could edit DNA, it wouldn't be the right approach because the RS142185 variant has a tiny little effect compared to the much more dramatic effect that you can have by changing the gene expression systematically. So that variant has seven pounds on uh, a, an adult individual of ex excess weight. I, I'm actually homozygous risk for the obesity variant. So I, you know, thank you, mom and dad. I have seven extra pounds than I would otherwise. But uh, by editing that variant, A, you would have to go back to before I'm born to sort of have the cumulative effects over a lifetime. And B, I mean, it's just you know, not the right way to intervene. What you would like to intervene instead is, okay, great. Well, we know you can't turn on these genes or you, have, you overturn on those genes. Let's go in pharmaceutically to alter your metabolism at the phenotypic level rather than at the genetic level. Um, so let's see, answer live, done. Once the gene is, oh, so Rohan Liu is asking, once the gene is identified, what would the treatment be for an already obese person? Uh, 
Well, uh, I'm sorry to say, but despite all our enormous amount of work on obesity and uh, exercise, the main thing I can say is uh, eat less, eat healthy, uh, drink lots of water, eat your veggies, <laughs> and, and uh, stay active. Uh, nothing, no treatment at all has ever superseded that. So for an already obese person, I would say uh, there's many, many treatments already for, you know, uh, gastric bypass, for example, can sort of get you on the path to mending. Uh, Novo Nordisk has one of the, you know, uh, sort of, uh, how do you say that, disclosure. Uh, my lab is actually uh, supported by Novo Nordisk, but uh, they tell me that they have uh, one of the uh, only drugs for obesity out there. So, you know, you, yeah, you could look into that. Um, and, um, you know, uh, what you could do uh, with more monitoring is understand which aspect of your metabolic network is dysregulated? You know, how can I trick it to, to become this, you know, sort of re-regulated? Are there specific nutritional interventions? Are there specific types of exercise? Are there specific types of fasting or of, you know, uh, sleep or other? Uh, and again, uh, I'm, you know, I, I, I'm not a physician. I don't see patients. This is something that you should talk with your, your own physicians for. But basically, the, the methods that we're developing, I'm hoping can help guide the patient classification and the um, overall uh, ways of uh, addressing these disorders uh, and understanding what are the, the, the measurements that we should make for each person to be able to predict the right type of response uh, for, each, for each person. Uh, all right, Danny Ruta. Hi, Manolis. As a public health physician, my initial reaction to your fascinating work is great. Just like Woody Allen's film Sleeper, <laughs> we'll soon be able to eat whatever we want and stop trying to change the obesogenic environment. But, the, but then I start to think about the wider socioeconomic consequences of altering the genotype phenotype circuitry. For example, I wonder what the consequences for food production and global economic inequalities might be from enabling the food industry to exploit our taste for fat and sugar. Oh my goodness. So I couldn't agree more with you, Danny. And in fact, one of the things that I'll say is, um, <clears throat> I'm gonna be a little provocative here. You only have so many bites that you can have in your life. The more you eat, the closer you come to death. <laughs> I'm a little provocative here, but what I'm trying to say is that I really don't want a treatment that will allow people to eat their heart out day in, day out, kind of like the Romans used to vomit after every meal and eat again. In that spirit that there are um, byproducts of metabolism that can poison your cells as you grow older and we're all evolved to only live for so many decades. And after that, you know, more or less everything falls apart. I feel that if we basically decide to go towards uh, sort of overeating, the, the, the health consequences will be, you know, dramatic uh, for even the, the super rich uh, individuals. Now let's talk about the global patterns. I mean, uh, I think, uh, again, we have to make exercise more fun. We have to, um, change people's motivations. Uh, we have to uh, address world hunger. The fact that we're worrying about obesity when you know half the world is starving. Uh, all of these are inequalities that are uh, at the public health uh, level. And I think you know what you're doing is much closer to addressing those. Uh, I can just share my own thoughts as an individual, not as a scientist. And uh, you know this is sort of you know where where my take is uh, on all that. The fact that we have to really figure out how to activate the will to exercise rather than the um, sort of, uh, you know, from, from a pharmacological uh, approach. All right, anonymous attendee is asking, what are your thoughts on prolonging life and stopping aging? Do you think that altering the genetic phenotype circuitry should be used to increase human lifespan? Why not? Why not? I feel that uh, the things that make us healthy are also the things that make us live longer. And um, uh, my, my take on aging research is that it's just about making people healthier, period. So it's not about living longer, it's living healthy longer and staying healthy longer. And whether there are pharmaceutical interventions, lifestyle interventions, you know, um, behavioral interventions that allow us to do that, I think that's something that's uh, you know, gonna help the whole world live better. We don't want people to be on uh, life support machines for another few decades. That's not the goal. The goal is to have healthy contributing members to society uh, for much, much longer. 
and um, you know, there's these uh, <laughs> beautiful songs by the song by the Beatles of when I'm 64. Uh, again, public service announcement, Eric Lander, my former advisor just turned 64 today. And uh, you know, he just moved to Washington to help his country in other ways. And I feel that all of us can basically think about at what stage in your career do you want to contribute to the world in what way? And right now I'm, you know, very happy doing what I'm doing. And as a student, I was very happy doing what I was doing. And, you know, maybe in a decade or two, I will be thinking about different ways of contributing as a writer, as a public speaker, as a, you know, sort of uh, contributor in, in many other ways. So I feel that prolonging age is the right thing to do if everybody can stay a healthy member and a contributing member to society. And otherwise, I think it's just absolutely the wrong thing to do. Uh, all right. Uh, your voice sounded so familiar. Now I realize it's from Lex Friedman. <laughs> so in case you're uh, interested in hearing another eight hours of my rambling about the human condition, uh, Google uh, Manoli Skelly's Lex Friedman. And uh, there's episodes uh, 113, 123, 133, and 142 that you're uh, welcome to uh, go in. I highly recommend. Yeah, <laughs> I, I really like this. All right. So do you have, uh, so Thomas Zumelzu Zumel is asking, you have found out the main cause of obesity, T2C nucleotide mutation in one particular locus. Did your team have tried to develop a therapy to target this mutation, such as an antisense RNA maybe? So Thomas, I want to point, and thank you so much for your question. You know, by the way, these are all fantastic questions. So Thomas, I want to distinguish the fact that we found the mechanism of the strongest genetic association with obesity. The main cause of obesity is overeating. <laughs> it's sedentary lifestyles. That's the main cause of obesity. As for the main genetic contributor to obesity, what we found is that it acts directly in our metabolic circuit, that it's not a decision that you're making. It's not a behavioral, it's not you know, a choice. You are uh, predisposed by your genome. And I think we need to somehow reconcile those two aspects. Basically on one hand, as a you know, uh, born, you know, person with the specific genetic combination that I have from my parents, I have a huge number of risks and, you know, protective alleles for countless disorders. Then there's the behavioral choices that I make. And of course, unfortunately, the behavior also has a genetic component on the specific brain circuits that I have inherited. And, you know, as much as we, we like to think otherwise, uh, you know, genetics has a contribution to, you know, many aspects of our, of our life or our body and of our brain. And, um, you, you know, it's, it's easy to say, oh, come on, all it takes is stamina. Well, <laughs> yes, but there's a genetic association with stamina as well. I'm pretty sure we'll eventually get to that. I mean, we found now countless genetic associations with schizophrenia, with many different psychiatric disorders. But as I showed in my, in my picture, there's genetic variants associated with quote unquote intelligence. And of course, intelligence is not one dimensional. Intelligence is extremely complex. But to deny that these genetic variants localize specifically within neuronal enhancers is preposterous. I mean, we have to embrace that environment plays a dramatic role into people's abilities and achievements. But, you know, every one of us is born with some genetic makeup. I mean, you know, they say that a person with one child believes in genetics, a person with two children understands genetics. And again, genetics is not like, oh, the kid is gonna be just like mom or just like dad. No, every kid is a unique combination of millions of you know, possibilities. And every kid has their own you know, uh, abilities and their own predispositions to disease and their own environmental impact and their own response to the environmental impact. You know, it's, it's, it's amazingly complex. So, um, we, we basically need to really embrace the fact that both genetics and uh, environment contribute greatly to who you are, to your motivations, to your will to exercise, to your will to eat healthy or you know, sugary foods and so on and so forth. And as a parent of three children, I'm working tirelessly to make sure that their environment is as enriching, as healthy, as safe as possible. And all parents do that. I mean, you know, we, we have a long way to go before we can you know, really truly bring equity for all people uh, on the planet. But, uh, you know, in the meantime, we have to realize that there are genetic differences between individuals and we have to, you know, understand those and combat those 
to really uh, provide with each person, uh, you know, the, the best support that we can given uh, their combination of uh, predispositions. So um, I, hope, <laughs> I hope that answers your question. All right, so um, anonymous attendee is asking, I loved your interviews with Lex Friedman. Chinese scientists applied CRISPR to twins in 2015. Do you think we can compete with China in a population level gene editing arms race? Uh, I don't think there is such a thing of a population level gene editing arms race. I mean, that's ridiculous. We should not be editing humans. We should not be trying to make humans smarter because what we're gonna end up with is uh, horrible consequences. Uh, even if we succeed, in, uh, you know, basically, um, if we decide to change everyone to be a super ridiculously smart person, uh, our world will crumble. <laughs> it, it, you know, the world doesn't work that way. There's no such thing as one dimensional intelligence. I mean, this is just ridiculous. Uh, in my own research team, I have extremely diverse scientists from, you know, very different backgrounds very different uh, skills, very different environments, very different trainings. Um, and I, I think it's just uh, crazy to think that any one of these variables is, is one dimensional. Uh, instead, what we should be doing is embracing diversity, embracing the fact that what makes the strength of the human race is diversity, is the fact that we think so differently of each other. And I wouldn't give that out for anything in the world. I, you know, I have hundreds of shortcomings the way my brain works. And uh, every one of my colleagues has a you know, completely different set of um, you know, ways that their brain is working. And I think it is that, that combination of all of these different ways of thinking and that collaboration that truly makes the world a, a better place. And if we give that up, then we've lost the battle. So I don't think it's an arms race uh, in any way. And I don't think that either China or the US or the rest of the world should be going there. All right, you have found, uh, oh, I see, so that was Thomas. Thomas, I hope I answered your question. Uh, anonymous attendee, what are your thoughts on using the genetics for treatment? Or do you think it will mainly be tool for diagnosis, understanding the disease, whereas treatment will not be at the genetics level, but more conventional one? I believe I've answered that one, so I'll skip that one. Uh, Danny Ruda is asking, there's an interesting theory discredited by, the, by neurologists mainly, I think, because it challenges the worldview that the etiology of multiple sclerosis is small air microemboli from mild head trauma and leading to an inflammatory response. Have you looked at inflammatory gene variants and MS? So multiple sclerosis is a classic autoimmune disorder. It's, uh, it shares a lot of genetic uh, associations. Uh, so, so basically it's epigenomic enrichments are aligned squarely on the same immune genes as type one diabetes, as uh, asthma, uh, a lot of other uh, allergies, et cetera. So it's a typical autoimmune disorder. Uh, contrary to Alzheimer's, which localizes specifically in the CD14 plus monocytes and macrophages. So um, multiple sclerosis uh, therefore uh, should be thought of in the same vein as all of these other immune disorders. Uh, the fact that it acts in brain has, you know, brings some similarities with Alzheimer's. And um, there is in fact, uh, you know, pathogen response uh, theory of Alzheimer's that basically suggests that amyloid beta, which is actually very good at trapping pathogens like viruses and bacteria and other sort of brain pathogens, amyloid beta might in fact be a response to some pathogenic infection that then 30 years later or 50 years later leads to uh, neurodegeneration and, uh, you know, cognitive impairment and memory loss. I want to warn all the young people uh, watching that we might be seeing the same thing with COVID right now. Everybody's like, ah, phew, I can get COVID no problem. I'll be just fine. I'll just lose my sense of smell for a little bit. I'll have a little, you know, mild uh, fog, uh, brain fog for a few months and then I'll be fine. But who knows if your brain while fighting uh, COVID is in fact building amyloid plaques in your, uh, you know, inside your, 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 your brain that will manifest in 30 years as a huge spike in Alzheimer's disease, as everybody who got COVID today is, you know, uh, turning older. This is what we saw for Parkinson's disease after the 1918 flu pandemic. For many decades after the pandemic, there was an enormous uh, increase in Parkinson's. People thought that this 
you know, would, if that Parkinson's would in fact completely go away after, uh, you know, all those people who were infected in 1918, 1918 um, uh, and then sort of the subsequent waves were, would in fact eventually die. Uh, you, know, you know, of course, it, it wasn't as drastic. It didn't happen exactly that way, but there's a, you know, very clear association between late life brain disorders and earlier life, um, you know, uh, pathogenesis. So stay home, wear your mask, uh, take the vaccine and, uh, you know, uh, stop this. Uh, as for multiple sclerosis and uh, small air, uh, you know, mild health trauma, yeah, I don't know the exact mechanism, but I wouldn't be surprised if in fact an environmental component of multiple sclerosis is in fact associated with the immune response. So, you know, this is completely non-surprising in my view. So in the same, uh, you know, for, for Alzheimer's, it's even more far-fetched for multiple sclerosis and for many autoimmune disorders. It's, you know, closer to mainstream, I would say. All right, so John Mason is asking, would you consider your genomic AI technological interventions as a part of the development of a progress towards next generation of transhumanism medical interventions? Could such technology change human phenotypic broad behaviors such as psychiatry or in child behavior and so on and so forth? Oh gosh, next generation transhumanism mess, medical interventions. So what do you call transhumanism? Is wearing crutches transhumanism? Is wearing uh, artificial uh, limb transhumanism? Is wearing contact lenses or, uh, you know, uh, you know, of course, yeah, brain implants, that's certainly transhumanism. Uh, maybe um, genome editing, you know, it depends on whether you're fixing a disease or trying to make humans better. So. Uh, <clears throat> could technology change human phenotypic broad behavior, such as psychiatry, child behavior, et cetera? Well, with psychiatry and child behavior, there's so much more we're understanding about the brain now, number one, from the genetic perspective and from the, uh, you know, neuroscience perspective. But at the same time, we have so many more ways of actually measuring what goes inside people's brains and also for intervening through for example, you know, visual stimuli, auditory stimuli through, you know, video games that a kid can play to sort of help them become more empathetic and, you know, uh, respond to whatever specific condition they might have. So I feel that we're in for a treat in terms of both diagnosing and also hopefully treating many of these conditions. And I don't know where you draw the line for transhumanism, but if it's sort of using technology to overcome our human limitations, uh, mostly on the fighting disease side, you know, that, that's great to me. If it comes about human um, embellishment and sort of pushing human faculties, then we have to absolutely worry about equity and, you know, how much the already ridiculously uh, separated um, uh, you know, social classes will become even more separated. And, and that's a horrible aspect of our society that we, I think, have the resources and need the willpower to overcome. So, uh, you know, I think that's something that all of us should fight for, uh, you know, more, um, you know, for, for addressing this systematically. All right, Anonymous attendee, what do you mean by restore? Surely they were already born with obese phenotypes. So, um, I don't know what I said with restore and in what sentence it was, but uh, they were already born with obese phenotypes. So listen, I, I, my, my weight has fluctuated. I mean, a few, a few years ago, I lost 60 pounds. Uh, I went from 183 to 133 in the span of 50 pounds in the span of six months. And um, yeah, I have the willpower to do it and I did it. And I don't know if I would do it again, but you know, I'm, you know, uh, I have three kids, I have, you know, a lot of students, I have a lot of things to worry about. Uh, you know, my health is important and I have to manage it, but we have to think about mental health. We have to think about bodily health. I think we need a balance of all of that. And, uh, if, you know, some people have way more willpower than I do and uh, they're doing great. And uh, I, I have to manage my, you know, sort of um, the, the full thing. Uh, now, I, I, I don't want to say that, you know, someone is born with obesity. I mean, yes, I am as at risk as, you know, uh, as bad as it gets basically, but um, somehow I'm fighting it and I'm still normal uh, and I'm not obese and overweight. So I, I, I think some people have worse environmental um, consequences than I did. So basically, 
I grew up in Greece with uh, you know a loving family, but also with a mom who loves sweets and who would feed me a lot of sweets. And uh, you know, a lot of many, many members of my family are bees, and um, you know, it's okay. I, like we all are dealt our own combination of uh, both environmental and genetic variants, and we all can do with them the most we can do with them. And um, I. Uh, I just want to sort of speak up against the genetic determinism. Basically, you are not what your genetics are. Uh, willpower and behavioral and environmental contributors are enormously important. And uh, you can fight against your specific combination of genetic variants that you were dealt with and uh, overcome them. All right. Who, uh, so uh, John Mason is asking, who would own the IP, intellectual property, of altering and altered genotype, phenotype, circuitry? Oh, God. Uh, well, IP has to do a lot with composition of matter. So just simply finding a genetic circuit is not enough. You have to actually show that you can manipulate that circuit. So whether you find a drug or any kind of intervention that sort of modulates that particular cellular pathway, uh, that's the person who has the IP. So I think there's a combination. There's some IPs for methodologies. There's some IPs for you know particular ways of intervention. If one person says, oh, I now have the IP for the methodology of altering thermogenesis, for example. And another person says, I have the IP for this chemical that alters that gene that then alters, uh, you know, thermogenesis, for example. You might have a combination, uh, you know, collaboration, and that's what the IP um, sort of structure allows you to do. So in terms of who owns the IP, it's going to be a combination of factors uh, who will then together collaborate to cure disease and reverse uh, these uh, circuits. Uh, all right, John Mason again is asking, once genomic mRNA platforms have been administered to subject humans, how long will the ongoing expression last for genomic mRNA platforms? Uh, mRNA is transcriptomic, it's not quite genomic, but anyway, uh, how long will the ongoing expression last for? Well, RNA degrades quite rapidly, so not enormously. And if there are problems, can the effects be reversed? Uh, yes, there are, there's a lot of talk about sort of how you can add the RNA kind of opposite to what you just entered. Uh, SI RNA, so small interfering uh, RNA can also help lower the expression of something that you've added and help degrade it through the dicer drosha um, molecular mechanism that's also used in uh, SI RNA pathways and microRNA pathways. Can the expressing mRNA inserted be switched off? Uh, yeah, basically for many of these synthetic biology constructs, uh, there are safeguards where you can sort of enter something that will shut it off. Of course, if that construct mutates and it loses the shadow of valve, you might you know, be in trouble for other ways and other reasons. I'm not a synthetic biologist, so <laughs> I'm trying to answer as generally as I can for each of those questions. But again, I'm not, you know, this is not, I'm not in the business of altering humans. I just want to <laughs> be cautious here. Uh, but I'll gladly answer any question uh, there. So anyway, I hope this, um, this helps. Um, next question by anonymous attendee. Do you think that machine learning tools can help in shortening the time between identifying targets and clinical implications? Golly gee, yes, yes. <laughs> so um, there's a lot of companies that are uh, involved in both better target identification, finding better targets to start with, finding the same targets, but faster, and also understanding how you can sort of develop the therapeutics once you have identified the target. So uh, graph neural networks, for example, have been used in chemistry by, you know, Regina Barzile at MIT and many others uh, across the world uh, to basically design, uh, so, so learn from a set of compounds and learn from a set of targets, uh, you know, chemical structures that are associated with uh, potency for a particular drugs. So absolutely, you know, that these kinds of machine learning tools can help, but also understanding what to measure and where to intervene and how to do all this uh, will, will absolutely help. All right, Mohammed is asking, given the detailed mapping between certain diseases and associated organs to genetic variants, are you concerned that health insurance companies can use this information to price insurance policies to maximize profits in a discriminatory manner? Um, let me be blunt here. The business model of insurance companies is to maximize profits in a discriminatory manner. So uh, the lack of knowledge is not what stops them. What stops them is regulatory uh, frameworks that prevent companies from doing that. And this needs to be solved not by limiting access to knowledge, 
but by preventing malicious people from using that knowledge against the good of society. So uh, there are laws that prevent genetic discrimination. There should also be laws for preventing X, Y, Z and you know, omega discrimination. And uh, we need to be better at that because tons of people are discriminated against for tons of ways based on so many different variables that are way more predictive than genetics. So your Gmail, uh, your search history, your, you know, uh, you know, dozens of companies like your Facebook is way more predictive of your uh, health risks than your genome is. I'm sorry to, to be so blunt. So if you're comfortable searching the web and if you're comfortable using Facebook and Twitter, uh, then you should also be comfortable just putting your genome up for the web for, you know, for anyone to see because uh, frankly, uh, it's much less predictive than all of these other things. Um, that said, uh, we, we, need, we need better protection. And you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna reveal my political views, but I feel that uh, you know, a healthy life should be the, the right of everyone on the planet. And every government should provide universal health insurance. Uh, and once you have universal health insurance, then it's a given that you're not being discriminated against. And then, well, I mean, of course, you know, all kinds of other protections need to be there, but your health insurance should not depend on so many different economic factors with so many people who are there to profit from your disease. So um, I think, uh, you know, drug development should be there for the betterment of all of society and for, you know, the health of all of the citizens of every country, not just for the rich. And I, I'm sorry if I'm revealing my political views there. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, so Neo Sukraj Hamer is asking, could you please elaborate on the negative byproducts of metabolism over time? Well, there's oxidative uh, products of metabolism, like as you're creating ATP, uh, the electron chain in your mitochondria that's producing energy has all kinds of oxidative species that then wreak havoc on your cells. So uh, look, look at sort of oxidative uh, species and uh, metabolism. I think you, you'll find more information there. Um, all right, anonymous attendee, could you reverse this and influence the circuits to perhaps lower the amount of energy burned to help people who suffer from world hunger? Absolutely, yes. So in fact, the uh, FTO variant, the one that I have, that's like the obesity associated, we call it pretty bad now because we're sitting in an office all day drinking you know, uh, soda and eating junk food. Uh, I mean, of course, don't do any of that. But um, if you look at the frequency of the risk allele for the FTO gene, it was at 2% frequency in Africa. It rose to 42% frequency in Europe, 44% frequency in Southeast Asia. A variant does not rise to such high frequencies just by chance and just by drift and just by sort of founder effects. Uh, my guess is that in the history of the human population, during the ice ages, during, you know, during um, sort of food scarcity periods, the obesity associated variant was in fact the favorable one in order to maintain more energy from the food that we eat. And um, uh, that circuit is in fact, you know, <laughs> already switched to the caloric storage uh, for Southeast Asia and for, you know, 42% of European chromosomes. In Africa, unfortunately, it's stuck on the sort of, you know, burn the energy position and uh, I don't think that editing humans is the way to solve world hunger. So <laughs> I just want to be blunt about that. Uh, we, we should just uh, make better ways of utilizing water, better ways of uh, sort of restoring uh, forests and crops and you know, lands and sort of maintaining water and trapping water in the soil and stuff like that. There's many, many people who are working on that. Uh, not, not entirely my area, but I, I just safely say that genetics is not the way to solve world hunger. What are your favorite podcasts apart from Lex Friedman? Oh gosh, uh, I, 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 I have to say that when I showed up in Lex Friedman's podcast, I didn't even know that there was gonna be video involved. I was like, my hair was all over the place. I hadn't shaved. So <laughs> I, I, um, I have since been hooked on uh, podcasts and I, I don't have any particular people that I follow. I just basically click on things that it recommends. I'm looking at a lot of neuroscience right now and um, a lot of, uh, you know, high energy physics and uh, sort of uh, astronomy and stuff like that. And um, uh, yeah, just biology, physics, um, 
and uh, psychology and uh, all of that. So I, I, I don't have any particular favorite, but I mean, I'm a huge fan of uh, Lex Friedman's uh, podcast, of course. And uh, I, you know, his, the favorite ones in his list uh, for me are basically the neuroscience ones. And uh, most recently, um, uh, Natalia Bailey, who uh, is talking about rocket, rocket science and uh, propulsion. All right, two more. Uh, thank you for your generosity in answering questions. You're welcome, John Mason. Uh, Darina, do you think one of the bottlenecks of current treatments around genomics, epigenomics is the delivery methods? What are the delivery methods technologies you're most excited about? Um, I feel that the uh, successes of Moderna and uh, BioNTech and Pfizer in delivering mRNA vaccines, uh, in my view, are immensely promising for everything. Uh, the fact that you can code an mRNA with all these modified bases that make it sort of less targetable by the immune system and that is clearly taken up will, no long, will not only revolutionize the way that we fight uh, viral infections, uh, uh, you know, in, in the next pandemic, I think will be much, much faster to, to act. Um, but the original goal of Moderna uh, was not virals, uh, you know, and vaccines. It was any disease by simply throwing in an RNA. So, you know, this is a very promising delivery methodology and there are many, many others. Uh, so um, I hope that answers your question. What books do you recommend me to read? How many books are on your shelf? Oh gosh, uh, lots of books. I, um, I, I have to say that I, I mostly download books and I read them. Um, there's this very cool app for uh, reading things aloud called uh, At Voice. So you can download a PDF on your phone and then when you're sort of doing all kinds of other stuff, it can just, you know, I read at like 3.5x uh, audio speed, which is, you know, requires a lot of attention. But, you know, when my body is doing other things, my brain is free to pay full attention to those things. So I, uh, I'm an avid reader. A lot of um, ancient life, uh, sorry, ancient civilizations. So basically sort of, you know, a lot of the things I'm very, very interested in is sort of what happened between, you know, 30,000 and, you know, 5,000 years ago that sort of, you know, dramatically changed humanity and uh, trying to sort of, you know, read about sort of the first cities and, uh, you know, of course, ancient Greece, but also what led to Egypt and to Greece and to these uh, great early civilizations. That's something that I'm greatly interested in. Uh, I'm also reading a lot of Chomsky and sort of language and uh, language evolution, you know, things like that, so Pinker and uh, those people. Uh, so anyway, I, I, I very interested in science more broadly. Um, I can't believe you stayed with us for two and a half hours. That's great. Thank you. This feels like we're in one of your John. Yeah, that's true. It's one of the Lex Friedman podcasts, only sort of uh, Jack's, you know, sort of, you know, packed with science. So thank you, Anonymous attendee. Uh, and then uh, John Mason, is there funding for carrying out this work on food and interactions with genomic cell environments? This is missing in medicine. There's a lack of funding. Uh, we need we need people to help with everything we do. So from discovering these to translating these, uh, you know, funding is very much the limitation. So um, any kind of connections you have for bringing more support to science, if you can talk to your congressman. Again, I'm very optimistic about having Eric Lander be on the cabinet uh, along with the science advisors. I'm, I'm uh, along with you know the war advisors. Having the science advisor there is very cool. I'm really hoping that at the end of the four years, the uh, science budget is the same as the uh, defense budget for the US. I'm crossing my fingers for that. And if that's the case, then the world will be transformed forever. So stop making war, uh, do more science would be the last words that I will finish this with. So thank you guys, I will stop there. That's brilliant, thank you so much. What, what a way to end it. Um, well, thank you everyone for coming. You can uh, look forward to two more days of talks. And, uh, you know, I just want to give a shout out to Manolis and staying with us for two and a half hours is more than generous. And I want to so, give a shout out to you and to all of the organizers for putting this together. I mean, this is an amazing series. I've learned a tremendous amount by watching the other speakers and I am super thrilled about what's coming up. So come back guys. Uh, there's so much more uh, for this. So thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye yeah. everyone. Bye everyone.